we've done uh, five principles about counting. We did the addition principle, the multiplication principle, the complement principle, the notice when two things are the same principle, and the count things multiple times in a controlled way principle. And then from there, we went through some of the ABCs that come up a lot in counting, combinations and permutations. And now we're doing the next step, which is to go through some more ABCs that come up in counting. And finishing up those ABCs, we'll move on to the inclusion-exclusion theorem, which I taught you back in set theory. And we're going to see how that connects back to counting problems. That is really a generalization of this complement principle. The inclusion-exclusion principle, if you remember how it works, is looking at the stuff that doesn't intersect, but they overlap. So it's kind of a generalized complement principle, and it's a lot trickier. But it lets you solve incredibly difficult sounding problems. So we're going to get to that today. Once we're done with that, we're done with what I think are more or less the basics of counting. There's one more principle, which is really all on its own. And it's a really simple principle called the pigeonhole principle. And it basically means that if you've got five pigeonholes and six pigeons, that when you're all done putting your pigeons in the pigeonholes, there's going to be one hole that's got at least two pigeons. It's like, it's like a no-brainer principle. But there are surprisingly subtle things you can prove with that simple principle. And actually, there are such things as pigeonholes down in caves, these little niches out. And people used to raise pigeons in them. So if you ever saw a cave with pigeonholes in the wall, you'd see why they call this the pigeonhole principle. It looks just like you'd think. And when you're out of room for pigeons, <laughs> right, yeah, right. <laughs> There's a lot of flying pigeons around. OK. Uh, The very last thing in this whole unit will be we're going to take all the stuff we've done on counting, the principles, the ABCs, the inclusion-exclusion helper uh, generalization of the complement principle, and we're going to take it all and see how does this connect to certain kinds of probability questions. And probability is a course that you can take independent of a combinatorics course. And when it's typically taught, it's taught in a very, very widespread way, often getting into statistics, often getting into calculus and continuous kind of things. The probability that we talk about in this class is a subset of that course called discrete probability, a very small subset. And it deals with probability that you can actually count. And it's really almost a 10-minute lecture on probability at most, and really just let's do all the stuff we did before in counting, but relate it to probability. So it's not going to be anything new. It's just going to be applications of counting to probability in a discrete way. So the real principles are really today and next lecture. And then it'll be just probability as an application. All right, questions? All right, so here's, here's our next one of our ABCs. We did permutations and combinations last time. And now we're going to do some variations on permutations and combinations, something you might call them generalized permutations or combinations. But here's one that I know you've seen before. And again, I'll do it by example. We'll call this a generalized permutation. we'll talk about generalized combinations. What I mean by generalized is that permutations and combinations have a very specific meaning. You have a certain number of elements. Permutations are you take some subset out and you care about the order. Combination is you take some subset out and you don't care about the order. A generalized permutation allows some extra parameter here. You're allowed to take out an element more than once. In other words, it's not just a set of n elements. It might be a set of n types. Like you have four kinds of cookies. You're in a bakery. You want to take six cookies. How many different ways can you do that? So there you can repeat. You can take the same cookie many times. That's a different kind of problem. So if you add repetition as a parameter, you get a more generalized look at permutations and combinations. Okay? That's what we're going to talk about right now. So here is, here's the first example. Here, this example you've seen before. Let's say you've got two different things, zeros and ones. And you want to, in order, choose a bunch of these zeros and ones and put them in a list. Say a list of five. Five zeros and ones. So here's an example. Well, how many different ways are there to take zeros and ones and put them in a list of five? It's how many binary numbers are there? You could list them all out. Start at 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 end at 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And you all know that inductively, this is kind of a straightforward idea. Because if I tell you how many there are for 5, then if I add one more possible thing 
a 0 or a 1. I can put a 0 in front of all the 5 cases and a 1 in front of all the 5 cases, and that gives me all the 6 possible cases. So it doubles every time. And we've done this in a lot of different contexts. We've seen that this is the same as the number of subsets, same as the number of binary numbers, length n. Let me write it down. Binary numbers, length n, equals number of subsets of a set with n elements. You can keep going and going. It's equal to so many different things. Let's say you have a big array in your computer, and if you know what I'm talking about, fine, and if you don't, it's OK. And you're going to cache into this array. You're going to store things into it in a very fast way. Well, what are the possible arrangements of this cache? Either the slots are filled or the slots are open. So it's like one big, long binary number. So if you have a cache with n elements, the number of arrangements is also the same as this. I'll write that down. Arrangements of a cache with n slots. Whether the slot is filled or not filled is just whether there's a 1 in there or a 0 in there. And there's 2 to the n of these. We did that before. We did it in a different context before we even started talking about counting. So in some ways, this was the first kind of counting you had ever done. You proved it. You proved it by induction. You connected it to sets. All right, questions. Who remembers this? Everybody? Does this make sense? Chris, do you have a question? Yep. OK. All right. Affirmative. An affirmative. Good. All right, here's my next point then. How does this, what does this have to do with permutations? This is the set of permutations of length n of two different items where you can repeat the item. So if I just said you have two items, 0, 1, how many ways are there to permute those items? The answer would be 2, 0, 1, or 1, 0. But what about when I can repeat my selection and I can go as long as I want? Then you get this generalized kind of formula. And actually, you can see the formula itself is not so bad. It's actually easier than, than other ones. Other kind of generalized formulas will be worse, but this one's easier. So let's think about this. We'll say this is also equal to the number of ways to permute two values. Um, no, it's hard to write this. The number of ways to permute two values uh, n times. Ugh. I don't like that. But you got two different values. You can permute them n times. And I'll say in parentheses, repetition is allowed. Because obviously, you can't do something n times with only two values unless you're allowed repetition. Yeah, Tony. Can you say a number of ways for you n, n, value, I'm sorry, n, <coughs> n values of two types? That's better. The number of ways to permute, I like that. The number of ways to permute n values of two types with repetition. That's better. OK, let me ask you a question now. If instead of binary numbers, I had three choices here, ternary numbers, uh, 0, 1, and 2, instead of just 0 and 1, then how would this change? It would turn to 3 to the n. I have three choices each time. Every time I add a new column, I get three times as many as I got before. A 0 in front, or 1 in front, and a 2 in front. So that, time, that means every single time I add a column, it multiplies by 3, n columns, 3 to the n. So in general, if it's k types, then the generalized permutation with repetition of n values of k types with repetition is, is k to the n. OK. So now that we have this, let's do a couple problems. Here's the one disk Tower of Hanoi graph. Remember this stuff? Mm -hmm. And then the next Towers of Hanoi graph, you take three copies of this and you connect them with edges. What are the nodes of a Towers of Hanoi graph? How do you represent them? Every value labeling one of these nodes is going to have a number 1, 2, or 3 representing what peg it's on, what post it's on. How many of those values are we going to have? The exactly equal to the number of disks in the problem. The one disk has one value. The two disk 
nodes would be labeled with two numbers, each of which is a 1, a 2, or a 3. That's exactly the same as the problem I just asked you a second ago. We have n values. We have three different possible types for each one. So there are 3 to the n nodes in the Towers of Hanoi graph. If there's one disk, there's three nodes. If there's two disks, there's nine nodes. That means, remember the Towers of Hanoi, the fast solution is 2 to the n minus 1, right? What would be the ridiculously hard solution if you took off the, the edge from from to 2 and from 2 to from? You'd go through everything, remember that? So it increases to 3 to the n. Right? So that's the worst it can get. If you don't draw the graph and you don't notice this, and somebody just shows you the Towers of Hanoi problem and says, hey, what's the worst this can ever be? You don't have a very fast answer. You might even know that 2 to the n minus 1 is something you can do, but you wouldn't know right off the bat that 3 to the n is the absolute you know, max. But if you make the graph and analyze it a little bit, now you can see that 3 to the n is the max. My question's about this. That's if you don't go backwards. I guess you can go backwards and then infinity's the max. <laughs> Just give it to a five-year-old to play with and you'd see that. Um, questions about this so far? All right, I want to do another problem to get a little bit harder here. There's three base three numbers of length one. How many base three numbers are there of length n? Three to the n, same as before. Now I want base three numbers of length n. I'm going to add a condition with at least one zero. OK? Everyone understand? So, so that wouldn't count. That would count. OK? I need at least one zero in this number. You can have zero, one, or two in a base three number. Any numbers that don't have zeros don't count. Any numbers that do have zeros, I want to count. All right. Let's think about this. So this is a different problem, right? It's a harder problem. I'll give you a, a, a hint. The trick to this problem is to think of the complement. Whenever you have ors in counting, ors are harder than ands. It's always harder to do ors than ands. At least one zero. That means it could have one zero or two zeros or three zeros, or four zeros. If you find yourself counting ors, there might be a better way to do it. Ors are very hard to count, because you have to divide them up into cases, and it, it really gets tricky. Sometimes it's the best way, but usually it's not. The best way to try to count is to convert something to ands, because if you can convert something to ands, then you can use the multiplication principle. If this has to be true and this has to be true, then you just multiply the two possibilities together. So let's try to convert this to a problem with ands in it. And that's the complement idea. The base 3 numbers that have at least one zero are the complement of the base 3 numbers that have, no that have no zeros. If they have no zeros, that's the same as the base 3 numbers that have ones and twos. Base 3 numbers that have ones and twos exclusively is the same thing as binary numbers. So let me write this down. At least one zero, that's the same as all the base three numbers minus the ones that have no zeros. That's the same as base three numbers minus the ones that have all ones and twos exclusively. So we've converted our way of looking into a problem using complement that turns our ors into ands. If you only use ones and twos, that means we want to know how many numbers are there of length n that have just ones and twos in them. That's the same as how many numbers of length n that have just zeros and ones in them. So what's this number? This is 2 to the n, and this number is 3 to the n. And that's the answer. Base 3 numbers of length n with at least one zero is 3 to the n minus 2 to the n. My questions about this? 
This kind of trick comes up a lot. It comes up on the problems that you're working on right now. I'll give you one example where it comes up a lot. It will save you a lot of time. If you're doing poker hands and you try to calculate the chance of a royal flush. Everybody know how to play poker? You all know how? Royal flush is a 10 through ace of a particular suit. How many royal flushes are there? Four. There's only four. Okay? So the chance of getting a royal flush is four divided by all the possible hands you could get. 52 choose five. That's an easy one. It's easy to calculate royal flushes. What if I said four of a kind? It's a little bit harder to calculate, but you could still count them up and do the appropriate choices and multiply appropriately. But if I tell you to calculate the number of ways to get exactly a pair, no better than a pair, just exactly a pair, that's tricky. Because once you choose the pair, you've got to be really careful that the other things you choose don't make you get something better. It's a little harder to count directly. But if you count using the complement principle, count what isn't a pair, you have an easier time. All right, so there's an example where it comes up. It comes up in a lot of examples. Always think about whether you can do the opposite more easily than the thing you're trying to do. OK. Uh, another example of this before we move on. How will we do this problem? On the theory that I'm, that I'm connecting it to what we just did. I'm not starting something completely new and throwing you in the jungle. Think about what we just did. How are we going to figure out how many base 10 numbers there are with at least two zeros? What's our strategy here? Minus the things that don't have at least two zeros. Well, what are the, how, how, do we, how do we say the things that don't have at least two zeros? The, the things with no zeros at all and the things with one zero. So now we've got two things we have to subtract off. So at some point, you start feeling here, well, is it worth doing the complement when the complement starts giving you lots of little pieces? Sometimes the complement gives you one simple thing to count. Sometimes the complement gives you a bunch of things to count. It's different in every case. See what happens here. Let's see how bad it's going to be. They're anded together, though, right? Anding is always nice, right? So the total number of base 10 numbers is 10 to the n. You got 0 through 9. Those are 10 different symbols. And you have length n. OK, every kid knows that if you have two-digit numbers, you have 100 of them. Right? Three-digit numbers, there's 1,000. We're going to subtract off all the numbers that don't have at least two zeros. That means. The 10 digit numbers with no zeros and the 10 digit numbers with, with one zero. OK, so far? Now, last time we did something very much like this. If there's no zeros, that means you just have the numbers 1 through 9. How many are there of those? 9 to the n, because you only have 9 possibilities, but they can go anywhere you want, and there's n slots. So that part isn't so bad. But this part's a little harder. Not too much harder, but a little harder. Now we want to figure out how many base 10 numbers there are that have exactly one zero. How do we count that? Is it 8 to the n? 8 to the n is almost right. For your zero, first. Yeah, yeah. Of the, you're gonna, you know you're going to have one. Because it's 10 times. So it's one of those n places is 10 to the zero. Right. So but would it be 8 to the n then, or would it be? Here. Here's n spots. n spots. I have allowed one zero here. I'm going to stick it right here. If you're thinking, whoa, how do you know you're going to stick it right there? I don't. I could stick it any place, and we'll have to count that later. But let's say I choose this spot to stick to zero. Then how many ways are there for me to fill up the rest of the spots with ones and twos? 10 to the n minus 1. Not 10 anymore, because I only have 9, nine symbols. To nine, 9 to the n minus 1. So once I pick my 0, I have 9 symbols to fill in the rest of the places. And how many places do I have left? n minus 1 other places. So once this 0 is chosen, I have 9 to the n minus 1 ways of making the number. But this 0 could be chosen in any one of n different spots. So it's n times 9 to the n minus 1. That's correct. 10 to the n minus 9 to the n plus n to the 9 to the n minus You can read it better than I can say it. Let me stop for a second. Same problem, 
but it's got to have at least three zeros in it. Okay? Everybody with me? Same idea. So if you weren't following the last idea, now's the time to jump back in. We're, we haven't left it yet. Three zeros, at least three zeros. Same method. Take all the possible base 10 numbers. Subtract off the cases that have no zeros. Subtract off the cases that have one zero. And now, the mystery spot, we have to subtract off the cases that have exactly two zeros. Now, this gets a little harder, but not much harder. All right, so, so let's look at it. Here's n slots again. Now we've got to choose a place for two zeros. How many ways are there, if we have n slots, to choose two places? n choose two. We don't care about the order that we choose them in. We're just going to try to pick two places here. So there are not n choose one this time, and I'm glad Seth mentioned that before, that n is really n choose one. Now it's n choose two. There's about n squared, more or less, ways for us to pick a pair of locations for the two zeros. And once we do that, how many ways are there for us to finish choosing the number? We have got, blah, blah, blah. We got nine symbols left. And now instead of n minus 1, it's n minus 2. So I'll write that down right here. n choose 2, 9 to the n minus 2. All right. I'm not going to do the next case because I'm hoping you can see a pattern here, even if you can't make the argument to yourself. So what's going to happen next? What's the next piece if I changed it to, to four zeros? What's the pattern? N choose 3, 9 to the n minus 3. And this is true, and it'll work all the way through. In fact, it'll work all the way through, and it'll give us this, it really, it's, well, it's screaming. It's screaming to me <laughs> to write a formula down. Combinatorics is a great thing. Combinatorics is a great thing to suggest all sorts of unrelated connection. So here's one. What if I said, what are all the base 10 numbers that, well, here I had three zeros, right, that have at least three zeros. And what did I do? I subtracted off the cases that, right, that don't have one, zero zeros, one zero, two zeros. I can add up all the base 10 numbers in the following categories. Base 10 numbers can be divided up into the ones that have no zeros. What's that? The ones that have no zeros? Nine to the n. No zeros. The ones that have one zero? And I'll write up here, no zeros. One zero. Two zeros. How far do I go? No zeros, one zero, two zero, or, or n zeros, or they're all zeros. So let me, I'll do the last two terms. Here's n minus one zeros, and here's n zeros. What do these last two terms look like? n choose n minus one times nine to the n minus n minus one, which is one times nine, plus n choose n times 9 to the, Zero. which is 1. See this formula? So the first coefficient is n choose 0 for 9 to the n. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Completely fine. Right. So it's completely symmetrical here. Let me write this as a summation. 10 to the n is the summation, i starting at 0, going all the way up to n, of n choose i times 9 to the n minus i. This represents each of these terms as i ranges from 0 to n. The first term is n choose 0, 9 to the n minus 0. The next term is n choose 1, 9 to the n minus 1. The next term is n choose 2, 9 to the n minus 2. This is a shorthand of writing it. All this says is that this sum is just a bunch of terms that all look the same. They're all n choose something times 9 to the n minus that something, and that something ranges from 0 to n. 
And this is true. We have a summation now that we never would have thought of straight up, but it came right out of this counting idea. Can we generalize the 10 to the... Absolutely. Turn this into an A, and this would be A minus 1. And Todd would remind me that we'd probably have to say that A has to be like greater than 2 or something. Or something. <laughs> something like that. And he'd be right. As any fifth grader. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Chris is right. You can de de definitely generalize this. Now, where else could this have come from? What does it look like? It looks like the binomial theorem. Where does it come from, the binomial theorem? Watch. It's not so strange where it comes from. 9 plus 1 to the n. That's 10 to the n, right? Remember the binomial theorem? You get powers of n followed by the complement powers of 1. You don't see the powers of 1 here because they're all going to be 1. So you just see the powers of n going down. And what are the things in front of those powers of n? The binomial coefficients. Run the binomial theorem through on this. You'll get this. So I could have shown you this yesterday, but I didn't because I wanted you to see how to get to it through some other path. That's really what math is really all about. It's finding the same treasure through different paths and then understanding better how to protect it. <laughs> in order to motivate this one, I'm going to do the most typical example that you'll see that every math teacher throws on a problem set or a test sooner or later that uses this idea. And then I will tell you what this idea is. Because once you have the example, then the generalized idea will make more sense. But here's a typical kind of question someone will give you. Let's say you have a word like babalu or any word. Just make up a word. Uh, <laughs> and the question is, how many different ways can I permute these letters? Can I rearrange them and get different words? Now, if all these letters were different, cab, how many different ways are there of arranging the word cab? Three times two times one, three factorial. It's n factorial. It's a problem that we did at the very beginning. It's one of the basic ABCs of counting. They're all different. You want to order them. There's three different ways to order the first one, two to order the second one, one to order the last one. Three times two times one. Simple, maybe. Here, the issue is... I made it. <laughs> <laughs> Here, the issue is that if you just rearrange these, in n factorial different ways, a lot of them look the same. Right? The two where we switch these two zeros look the same as these two zeros. Right? So you can't just say it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 factorial. Too many of those 7 factorials will be counted multiple times. So how do you do it? Well, there's two different ways to think about it based on the ABC tools that we've already learned, and they're going to be identical. So, so let's look at it in two different ways. Here's the first way. Uh, I've got how many different items here? One, two, three, four, five, six. I got seven items. How many different types do I have? Four. One, two, three, four different types. Four types. And more specifically, how many of each type do I have? I have two, two, two one. one, and two. OK? That represents the number of each type. You need a lot of information to solve this problem. You need to know how many different things you're permuting. You need to know how many different types. And you need to know how many of each type you have. So this is kind of in between allowing complete repetition and allowing just one copy. Now we allow particular numbers of copies of each. Everybody see how this is a more generalized version of the same kind of problem? Instead of any number of copies of the different types, we allow specific quantity of, of, of that type. How do we count this? Does anybody have an idea? You have an idea? 7 factorial gives you 2 minutes, so you want to reduce it. By OK. How much should we reduce it by? by 7 factorial gives you too many. So th this will be the counting multiple times in a controlled way style of doing this. 7 factorial gives you too many. Do you have an idea of how to cut it down? No. We're just finding the possible permutations. We're not actually trying to make this into words, right? 
that makes right, sense. right, 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 right. It doesn't have to be a real word. Right, right, right. Lou Baba is going to be just fine. <laughs> Every single permutation that has two A's in it is counted twice. So let's divide through by another two. Every single permutation that has two O's in it is counted twice. Two times two times two. Every single permutation with an L in it is counted once. I'll divide through by one. All you do to solve this problem is take the number of items, calculate the total number of permutations, and divide by the product of all the cases that get counted multiple times. In this case, 7 factorial divided by 2 times 2 times 1 times 2. Now, if one of them occurred three times, if one of them occurred three times right, right. If this was 3, then you would have counted that one six different times for every single permutation. So what these really should be, to make it general, is 2 factorial, 2 factorial, 1 factorial. I'll do the same problem with, with some bigger numbers just to show you. Let's say I have 100 items, four types, 10, 20, 30, 40 of each type. How many different ways are there of permuting these items in unique ways? I got 10 of type 1, 20 of type 2, 30 of type 3, 40 of type 4. It's going to be 100 factorial divided by 10 factorial times 20 factorial times 30 factorial times 40 factorial. Right. Don't compute that number at home. <laughs> All right, questions about this? This is one way of looking at it. This is the multiple counting way of looking at it. This is what Neil suggested. And we're going to look at it a different way in just a second. That will be equivalent, but a different way of looking at it. I've got 100 items. Okay, I want to permute them in any way I can, and I want to make sure that I'm only counting unique ways of permuting them. So one way to do it is to think of it as I got 100 slots. Okay? The first thing I'm going to do is put in all the different items of type 1. Put them in wherever you want. We'll call these A's, call these B's, call these C's, call these D's. So the A's can go in in how many different places? There's 10 of them. They're going to go into any one of 100 places. 100 choose 10. I've got 100 choose 10 different ways of choosing different places in here for those 10 A's. Now, the order does not matter, right? That's the whole key, is that I'm doing combinations here, not permutations. I just switched a permutation problem into a combination problem by looking at it in a different way. That's a principle that's really important, and you'll see it come up again in a little bit. I am now thinking about permuting these items by doing the following thing. First, take all the items of type A and find a place for them in these 100 slots. I don't care what order they go in. Because those are the ones that are counted duplicate if I, ca if I care about the order. So forget about the order. Just throw them in. But then it's a combination if you forget about the order. So it's 100 choose 10 to place the type A items. 100 choose 10 different ways. And when I'm done doing that, I'm still not ready to define my number. I still have 90 slots left. So let's move on and place the type B items. How many ways are there to place the type B items for each one of these 100 choose 10 ways that I place the type A items? 90 choose. Very good. And the next set? 70 choose 30. Everybody see what's going on? Let me make it clear if not everybody gets it yet. If I've chosen 10, then there's only 90 slots left. I pick 20 of those for type B. Now there's only 70 slots left. I pick 30 of those for type C. And now there's only 40 left. That should be pretty clear, right? Because once I put the A's and the B's and the C's in, I don't have any choice for my last item. And that makes a lot of sense that it should be just one. Now, if you're not really comfortable or, or used to these things yet, it would not be obvious to you right away that this is the same as this. But it is. Just work this formula out, and you'll find right away that these two are completely identical. This is not some weird paradox where we have to say which one is right. They're both right. There's nothing wrong with this argument. This is a fine way to do it, and that's a fine way to do it. And they're both reasonable ways. 
This is an example of turning a permutation to a combination and doing it step by step. Here's an example of the multiple counting idea. Different ways of thinking about the same puzzle, but they give the same answer. All right, let me convince you that it really is. 100 choose 10 is 100 times 99 times 98 down, down all the way to 91. Right, 100 all the way down to 91 divided by 10 factorial times, what's this? 90 down to 71 divided by, do you see what's happening? Do you see why it's the same as 100 factorial divided by 10 factorial, 20 factorial, 30 factorial, 40 factorial? The top here just concatenates these factorials all together in the perfect order. So what we do here is the same as what we do there. Questions about this? Another example of things being the same that don't seem to be the same at first glance. These are generalized permutations of k types with fixed amount of each type. Just so you see some notation, which you might see one day, if we call the different amounts of each type, k1, k2, k3, and k4, then sometimes this is written like this. p of 100, comma, 10, 20, 30, 40. The 100 is the number of items, and the four different type values go afterwards. And I put semicolons there so you remember that these are the types and that this is the number of items. I don't know what our book does. Our book might do something similar. It's, there's some notation to indicate that those are the four types, and the first number is the number you start with. Let's go back to Babaloon. Remember, we were permuting this where the types were 2, 2, 1, and 2. We were permuting seven things, this many types of each. Now, let's say I had four boxes here. Box number one, box two, box three, box four. B1, B2, B3, B4. And I wanted to ask you, how many different ways are there to take these letters and throw them in these boxes where I insist where I insist you have to have two in this box and two in this box and two in this box and one in this box? It seems at first like that might be a different problem. But that's really the same problem, and I want to convince you of that. So I'll say it again, and I'll show you that these two problems are the same. The number of ways to distribute, oh, I might not have said what I meant a second ago, so listen now. The number of ways to distribute seven distinct objects, do I mean that? No. They're non-distinct objects <laughs> into distinct boxes. I think this is what I mean. And if this isn't what I mean, then I'm going to have to come back to it later because I'm, I'll confuse myself. <coughs> With 2 in B1, 2 in B2, 1 in B3, 2 in B4. I wonder if I mean this. I mean distinct, huh? In other words, there's just one way to do it. Yeah, I agree. I mean distinct. Good. Do I mean distinct boxes or non-distinct boxes? Well, they have to be distinct boxes. boxes. You qualify how many of them are going to be in B3 separately, right? Yes, I agree. <coughs> no, but I can just say two and one of them, two and another, two and a third, and one and a fourth, and I don't really care about which Um, Would a distinct object mean are, are B and B distinct objects or not? Because we only have four distinct types. 
Let me show you what I really mean. This is the B box, this is the A box, this is the L box, this is the O box. Okay? These numbers, think of them as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I'm going to put these numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, in these boxes. I'm going to put 1 and, say, 4 in this box. I'm going to put, pick anything, 2 and 6. Here I get to only put 1 in, 3. And here I got what I got left, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5 and 7. Which one of these permutations does this correspond to? It means B is going to be in positions 1 and 3. A is going to be in positions 2 and 6. L is going to be in position 3. And O is going to be in position 5, 7. I don't care whether the numbers go in the box 5, 7 or 7, 5. It's just a big empty box. I just look inside. They're all messed up in there. So the order inside the box doesn't matter. So I want to take seven distinct objects distribute them into four distinct boxes, two in this, two in this, one in this, two in this. And that's exactly the same as permuting these values seven different ways where I don't care about the order of the O's or the order of the A's or the order of the B's. All right. I made this much harder than it needs to be. This is, this is a much more exact one-to-one -one than it seems, yeah. But I want you to see this example that you can think of a permutation problem as a distribution problem. So it is distinct. I, I had it right the first time. I just got a little confused. They're labeled, B-A-L-O, distinctly labeled. And you want to represent this particular permutation, the Babalu permutation, as a distribution into these boxes. Right. So how, how do you do it? You go 1, 3, 2, 4. 1, 3, five, good. Seven. 2, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So if I gave you seven items and I said distribute them, you have to put two in the B box, two in the A box, one in the L box, two in the O box. Every time you finish doing it, I could write a distinct permutation of those letters up on top that is a one-to-one -one correspondence with this. And every one of these permutations has one of these distributions, and every one of these distributions has one of these permutations. You have to keep in mind that the order in the box doesn't matter. Right? Everybody understand that? If it did matter, then, then this wouldn't be the same anymore. Yeah. Joe? Do you have to put the limitation on how many objects can go in each box? Yes. Yeah, because if I, if I let three objects go in box B, that corresponds to having three Bs in my permutation. I only have two Bs. So box B's got to get exactly two of these positions from the seven. I have to be very specific about what goes in these boxes. The equivalency is saying the number of the number of ways that the probability could be arranged is equivalent to the number of ways that you can throw seven boxes, seven letters in those four boxes, given those constraints. Given these constraints, the number of ways to throw seven different objects into these four boxes, given these constraints, where the boxes are labeled, you know, B A L O, is exactly the same number of ways as you can rearrange these letters into distinct configurations. Again, to start off, I want to do an example. And the example here is going to be just like the regular combinations that we've done before, but now I'm allowed to repeat. So here's what it looks like. Combinations with repetition. Is that how you spell repetition? From three distinct types let's talk about combinations with repetition from three distinct types and as a particular example let's say I want to take eight of these so combinations say of length eight length eight put it here combinations of length eight with repetition from three distinct types if I ask you how many combinations are there of three distinct types that you, well, you can't repeat, 
and I want to take two of them, it would be three choose two. Right? But now I'm taking eight of them, so I'm going to have to be able to repeat. But I don't care about the order this time. This is equivalent to the following problem. You go into a bakery. You want to buy eight things. You want to buy eight things to eat at a bakery. We'll make it practical. You want to buy eight things to eat at a bakery. They sell cookies, brownies, muffins, <laughs> donuts. They only sell one kind of cookie, one kind of brownie, one kind of muffin. So they got three big barrels. That's this bakery. One big guy stands behind the three barrels and says, Muffin, cookie, or brownie. <laughs> you say which one you want, he gives it to you, charges you some money. But you want to buy eight of these things. <laughs> if you buy three brownies, three muffins, and two cookies, that's one way to get your eight. It doesn't matter whether you buy three muffins from the top of the muffin barrel or three muffins from the bottom of the muffin barrel. It just counts as three muffins. It just matters how many muffins you buy, how many brownies you buy, how many cookies you buy. Okay, everybody get the problem? So how many ways are there to go ahead and get your eight items taken from the bakery if you can only take from these three barrels? This problem, I think, is the coolest kind of problem because it is not obvious when you first think about it and when you finally see how to do it, it becomes easy. A lot of problems are like that. But this one really connects back to regular old combinations without repetition. And the connection is, is one of the most powerful tools you have in your bag of tricks. So not only can permutations turn into combinations, but generalized combinations can turn into simpler combinations. And I want to explain how this works by first doing a couple of examples. So let's call the... Uh, Let's call these three barrels M, cookies, brownies. OK? Muffins, cookies, brownies. Let's put a couple of possibilities up. We could have, uh, let's say, three muffins, three cookies, and uh, two brownies. That's one possibility. Where's another one? We could have uh, eight muffins, no cookies, no brownies. Was that Anthony likes muffins? All right, just a couple more. Six here, one here, one here. All right, everybody see the different possibilities? So the question is, how many of these are there? If I write it like this, it doesn't give you a clue at all. Or maybe it does, but not to me. So how can we write it to give us more of a clue? Here's a different way to write it. Mm. You mean we could we could have like we could have some number of M's followed by some number of C's followed by some number of B's, right? And you just have to have a total of eight of them. But but it doesn't connect to what we did last time because last time we had to have a certain number of M's, a certain number of C's, and a certain number of B's. Here it's the sum that has to be equal to something. So that connection is is there, but but not so obvious how to how to exploit it. Yeah. yeah. I tried it with just if you had just two choices to make it easier. Yeah, and then that, and then a, go yeah, from there. And then go do recursively up to three. That's a that's a great strategy. That's a great strategy. Um, the number's determined no matter what. Agreed. Right. Once you choose the first two, then you have to choose that number for the last one. So if we made it just two choices, then you really just have one choice, and then the last one's determined. Should we do Neil's idea? We'll do real pedagogy today. Instead of me just showing you the answer, we'll we'll discover it together. I think Neil's idea is really good. So let's. Let, let's hold off on this problem, switch over here to the side of the board, and deal with a, with a two case. How many different ways are there? Nine. You get to choose 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7, or 8 here. Mm -hmm. And then this is already determined. Mm -hmm. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, that's nine possibilities. And that's it. It's just nine. So with, with two items, it just seems like it's like it's this plus one. All right, well, is it illuminating? A little? 
Does it generalize? Uh, maybe. <laughs> Right, now I just take the third one, right? Those possibilities for the third one down, and then you got plus what's left for the two. Mm. But if you... T <clears throat> so let's say we choose one here, right? So here's Neil's idea. Neil's idea is that we'll try 0 through 8 for the first one, and then if it's 0, we've got, seven, we have got 8 choices left for the last two. That we can do with a 2 case. If it's 1, we have 7 choices left for the last two. Right? And if it's 2, we've got 6 choices left for the last 2. This is a good idea, and you will come up with a formula, but as you can see, as the number of things get bigger, this formula becomes a long recursive formula, and it would really be a good direction to go if I had another hour today to, to follow it. It would be a nice way to go. But I want to short circuit like, it for a second. Like 9 factorial? Because, or no, no, 9, the, the triangle number, 9. For the three cases, you get the triangle numbers added up. The next cases, they kind of get summed up themselves. Uh, Oh, I'm, well, I don't want to go down this road, even though it's a good road, be, just because I didn't have enough time to do it. But, but it is a good road to go down. Yeah. Rob, you had a question? Well, why does it have to be a recursive equation? Doesn't it just look like it's uh, the number of pipes times the number of bins minus one factorial from what Neil said? I, mean, I don't think so, because, because each of the choices for the first bin gives you a different problem for the other two bins. If you choose 0 here, you have a 2-bin problem with 8. If you choose 1 here, you have a 2-bin problem with 7. And if you choose 2 here, you have a 2-bin problem with 6. So for 3 bins, you get the sum of these 2-bin problems for different numbers. And for 4 bins, it's going to be even a bigger sum of 3-bin problems which will then in, be in turn a sum of two-bin problems. So there's, there's, no, there's not even multiplication here going on. There's a lot of addition here that's going on. Okay. So, so Neil's saying here, try zero for this, then the other two boxes have to be filled with eight things. That's a two-bin problem with eight. If you choose one here, then these two boxes have to be filled with seven things. That's a two-bin problem with seven. So you have to add all those possibilities together, and, and you don't get a factorial. Or maybe you had a different idea. But let, let me suggest this way of looking at it, which will take us back to something that will short circuit this very nice uh, excursion that you, um, that you thought about. And here's the way I want to look at it. The eight things I'm just going to represent as, uh, as x's. Six, seven, eight. They are neither muffins nor brownies nor cookies right now. How do I turn them into muffins, brownies, and cookies? I got to divide them into three sections, right? How do I divide them into three sections? I'll add in a little squiggly line separating them. How many squiggly lines do I need to put in to divide them into three sections? Two, two squiggly lines. Okay, so far. Mm -hmm. So let's do six one one. Uh, six one one will be this one two three four five six. That's six one one. Okay, that stands for. It left, going left to right is brownies, cookies, muffins. Six brownies, one cookie, one muffin. Let's do the next one, zero, zero, 008. Where do the squiggly lines go then? Where are the squiggly lines here? Eight? Ah, oh, jeez. Here. Zero, zero, eight. Three sections. This section has nothing, this section has nothing, this section has eight. How do you represent this one? Two, three, three. Two, three, three. Everybody see what I'm writing down? I'm just writing it down with pictures. I'm taking every one of these ways of distributing the objects and making into this picture. And now I'm going to ask you a different question. How many of these pictures are there? Because if we can count this number of pictures, we can count these things. Doug yelled out 9, choose 2. Does that make sense? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We've got 10 different places. And the squiggles can go. Can they go anywhere in those? Where can they go? Wait, ten places? Or 
places. <laughs> there are nine places, aren't there? Yeah. You can't have seven Because they're in the same place. If harumph, 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 harumph. <laughs> Who knows? How, uh, let me remind you what we're up to. You can talk amongst yourselves, but here's what we're up to. <laughs> We're trying to count how many pictures these are, where I have eight X's and two squiggle lines, okay? And they can be presented in any order you want, but I've got eight X's and two squiggle lines. Yeah, Jeff. If you take the X's and turn them into zeros and the squiggles and turn them into ones, then you just have a binary problem. Okay. Or if you just, where there's not a squiggle, make it a zero. Yeah, right. Where there's a squiggle, make it a one. Okay. So I agree, I can turn these into binary numbers, but there's something very specific about these binary numbers, right? I only have, I only have uh, eight of zeros and two ones. So did we ever do a problem where we had two different types of things, where we had to use exactly a certain number of each type and figure out the different permutations of those types? Yeah, Rob. There have to be two of these things. Are we just going to add a special case where the squiggles are on top of each other? Because there's yeah. no brownies, say? Yeah. They're next to each other. If there's no brownies, say there's, let's do it. Say there's a, let's say there's no brownies and there are six uh, cookies and two muffins. So six cookies, squiggle, squiggle, two muffins. No brownies in between. You're choosing m things from n. You have n different types. This is going to be the same as m plus n minus 1 choose n minus 1. That's what we just did right now. I want to convince you that this is the same as another kind of distribution. The first problem is the same as the distribution of distinct objects into distinct boxes. And here, See if you can figure it out. It's a distribution of, think of the cookie problem. We're taking three boxes of cookies that we're going to bring home with us in a little container. A box for muffins, a little box for brownies, a little box for cookies. Okay? We're taking eight of our choices. Okay, I have eight dollars. So they say everything costs a dollar. You guys gave me eight single dollar bills. I'm bringing them home. What I'm going to do in order to decide exactly how many cookies, muffins, and brownies I'm going to bring home is on my way to the store, I take all your eight single dollar bills and I drop them into one of these boxes. If I drop three in the brownie box, it means I'm going to get three brownies. If I drop four in the cookie box, it means I'm getting four cookies. And then I have to drop one in the muffin box. So that's this combinations with repetitions of n types, where we're taking m of them, m are the dollars, n are the three boxes, is the same as distributing m things into n different boxes. Distribution of m, are the m objects distinct or non-distinct? They're non-distinct. They're all single dollar bills. It's like those x's. M non-distinct objects. That's the that's distinct from the last example when they were distinct. Distribution of M non-distinct objects into N distinct boxes. This distribution problem is equivalent to this problem. My point of showing you the equivalence of distributions in both these cases is that when you get a distribution problem, you should always be able to convert it to a combination or a permutation. They are really just applications of combinations and permutations. They are not one more thing to memorize. They are just the co a logical continuation of what you've done. If you want to start memorizing things, you are going to kill yourself in this topic. Here's the things you can memorize if you want to. The formula for regular permutations. The formula for permutations n choose k. The formula for combinations n choose k. The generalized formula for permutations where you have a certain number of each type. The generalized formula for combinations when you're allowed to do repeat. The general formula for permutations when you're allowed to repeat. Distributions of non-distinct into distinct. Distributions of distinct into distinct. Distributions of non-distinct into non-distinct. You can memorize a formula for every single one of these. 
Every single one is a different formula. You can memorize them, and then when you get a problem, you're going to have to, number one, instead of thinking about it from a fresh perspective, all you're going to be doing is saying, which one of these nine categories does my problem fit in? And you won't have had enough personal experience pulling a problem apart to have any good skill at doing that. So you're likely to end up throwing the problem in the wrong category. Then you're likely to mismemorize the formula. So if you're really lucky, you throw it in the wrong category, <laughs> mismemorize the formula, use the right formula on it, and get it right. This is the worst way to do this type of stuff. It's a good way if you're desperate. If it's a good way if all you really want to care about is, I've got to get through the next day, and I just want to get this problem right. But if you really want to develop these skills, then the way to do it is to concentrate on those five principles, to look at these examples as basic examples that come up a lot. And every time you get a new problem, to work on it from scratch until you are reminded of something you've done before. If you're not reminded, then go back and review it. But when you start to get reminded, then go back, then make the connection, and then these things, then these things will be inside you. One more word of this proselytizing before I, I let you go today. I do not remember these formulas. I cannot remember if you gave me a list Here's all the permutations with repetition, without repetition, distinct objects, non-distinct objects. And you said, write down all the formulas. I would get a 40 if you gave me five minutes to do that test. I couldn't do it. I would have to think about each one, think about what it means, relate it to the one that I was most familiar with, and then reconstruct the formula as I go. Okay, some things you remember because they come up a lot, but the less you have to remember, the better. You want to just fill your brain with as few principles as possible and just let the neurons do their job. Don't clog it up. All right. Uh, questions about this stuff? Here's where we're up to. We have now finished with what I think are the basic combinatorial principles and the basic combinatorial ABCs. There's a lot there. It takes a lot to digest this stuff. What we're still going to do is using the inclusion-exclusion theorem as a way of milking these principles one step further and doing problems that otherwise would be very hard. And the inclusion-exclusion theorem is really just kind of a generalized complement idea. Then we'll talk about the pigeonhole principle, discrete probability. We've got about two to three lectures left on this material. And then we're going to move on to, uh, to number theory in the last unit for this course.